Good morning and welcome to this service of worship today. We are so glad that you're here. I'm Pastor Rachel. Our liturgist today is Leanne, um, and we're delighted to be sharing in this worship time with you. Uh, those of you joining us online, thanks. Thanks for being here. Um, Put your name in the chat. Let us know you're here. Anything that you want us to be praying for, uh, we would love to know about that. Uh, and those of you in the sanctuary, you can do the old fashioned version of that and sign in on the little blue pad that should be on that side of your pew. Um, sign it, pass it down. That helps us know who's here and also if there are things that you need. And if one of the things you need is a little assistance in hearing or sight, uh, for this worship service, we have some devices. We have um, uh, hearing assistance headphones. We have uh, little flashlights to help make it brighter. We have large print bulletins uh, and we have fidget devices if you just got to move. Uh, so whatever it is that you need, we want to make this place accessible to you. Uh, we do have several announcements about the life of the church um, before we begin our full service. Um, I wanna call up Luke Anderson, who's going to give an announcement from the ONA Open and Affirming Committee. And while Luke is coming up, um, you may have seen the choir robe in the narthex. We want to remind you that if you enjoy singing, notice I did not say if you are good at singing. If you enjoy singing, there is a place in the choir for you, and there is even a fancy robe. Um, so uh, that may be a turn off or a plus, I don't know. Anyway, come join the choir. Uh, first practice is September 6th. Uh, okay, Luke. Good morning. Um, as many of you know, our open and affirming committee has been hard at work for the last two years uh, following a recommended process to educate congregations on what it means to be declared an open and affirming church before taking a vote. We now have a date for that vote, Sunday, October 22nd, for you, the congregation, to cast your vote on a written covenant, proclaiming that our faith community publicly commits to, li to living as a welcoming faith community on a lifelong journey. Knowing that it is important to fully comprehend what and why we are voting, we're hosting three more educational events between now and October 22nd. We may be all at different places in our understanding, and that is okay. You may be wondering what difference this may make for our church. Aren't we already welcoming of LGBTQ people? Will we become a gay church because of this? Will our church look different? What will change and what will remain the same? And we have those answers as well as donuts. <laughs> our next session is going to be this, not this Sunday, uh, on Sunday, September 3rd. Uh, we'll start promptly at 9.30. Details on the remaining two sessions are still being finalized as of today. But no matter if you're not sure what LGBTQ plus even means, or if you feel like you're someone who could have already been leading these sessions yourself, your attendance and your voice truly matter at these gatherings. If you can't make one of the last few remaining educational events, we have members of the ONA committee coming to share a short bursts of educational info each Sunday during announcements until October 22nd. If you'd like to tank things in your own time, we of course also have plenty of resources available that can be found in your weekly spotlight email on our church website, and as well as a poster board in the Narthex that will be back up next week. Our UCC faith calls us to be intentionally welcoming of all and love all fully as God has created us. When we call for a vote on October 22nd, it will be in support of a written covenant proclaiming that our faith community publicly commits to living as a welcoming faith community on this lifelong journey. The scripture from Romans from ONA proclaims, accept one another just as Christ has accepted you in order to bring praise to God. We hope we can see you at our next event. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. 
And I'm going to invite Rich to tell you about another event. And while he is coming up, I want to remind you that adoptions for college students are open. This is a low stakes adoption, uh, but it is a way to let our college students know that um, they uh, are loved and remembered while they're away. Um, there's a sign up sheet in the narthex or if you are online and want to uh, help do this loving ministry, um, please just make a note in the chat and we will get to you. Uh, and also I want to remind you um, to have lots of spinach and iron and then come give blood tomorrow um, at our blood drive, which is from 1 to 6 p.m. You can sign up at redcross.org. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. I'm here to ask you to mark your calendar for September 10th, the church picnic. This year, we'll be celebrating the picnic uh, with the worship service at Charlie Vetner uh, Park, and it will start at 1045 to where we'll have church and uh, featuring Soul Shaker. Uh, and then afterwards, we'll have a fried chicken uh, uh, supplied, and we ask that everybody bring a, a potluck dish. So I do have a sign up sheet with an attached pen uh, for you to uh, see if you're able to come, how many people will be in your party, and what you can bring. Uh, we will have our uh, mobile Hoffman ice cream dessert bar uh, there to uh, uh, keep everybody cool. And we uh, hope that you could uh, be a part of our picnic at uh, Jolly Ventnor Park. Thank you. Thank you. And that is instead of worship here on that Sunday, just so that that is very clear. Um, all right, lots going on. Lots of ways that we love and support each other. And lots of ways that we are church together. We hope you will find a way to let yourself be part of this loving community, not just here in worship, but also in some of the other things that we are doing. Because here in this place, God welcomes dreamers and doubters, the worriers and the wanderers. Here in this time, we can remember all the ways that God has graced us, even when we didn't deserve it. Here in these moments, we are reminded that God is with us always. And here we know that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Friends, let us pray. God of abundance, be with us today as we come to you from all of life's circumstances, as we feel needs and wants deeply in our souls, turn our eyes too to the ways that you are offering us love. Give us courage and strength and fill us with your love and grace that we may serve you effectively and fully. Amen. I invite you to rise in body and spirit and join us in our opening hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
the kids and kids at heart can come up front. <laughs> grab and bring your friends. Okay, I'm gonna grab her and bring your friends. I like this one. <laughs> Somehow she puts up with this one all the time. <laughs> and we got baby. We got uh, baby Caroline, right? Baby Caroline. We're willing to take care of people, right? So I have a big word. It's not really a big word. Ooh. Um, Noah, can you turn down lapel one? Sorry. Thanks. Okay. Oh, thank you for the ball. Okay, so my big kids, what's it say? What's it say? Big forgive. Who likes to forgive people? Really? You gotta, you gotta, really? That, that kind of sounds like most of the time. So last week we talked about the guy who that coat back there kind of resembles. That's kind of his like symbol. And he had some brothers that um, we're gonna go with not very nice to him, right? They were very, very mean. And hold on, yes, yes. Um, and afterwards, somebody he he got to know the king, and he ended up having a really cool gift that kind of sounds a little crazy. He interpreted dreams. Have you ever had a weird dream? I have. Do you ever wonder what those weird dreams meant? I sometimes have, and then I promptly forget the dream usually. But Joseph was good at this thing about saying like, well, I had a dream and it means this. And then sometimes his dreams and his interpretations, they were right. And then the king was like, wait a minute, this guy knows what he's doing. Well, eventually he had one of those dreams and it saved everybody in his land, including those 11 brothers that were not nice to him, that were really mean, and that tried to hurt him very badly. And then the 11 brothers came back. And guess what they were asking for? Forgiveness. forgiveness. Is it easy to forgive? Is it easy? Sometimes. Sometimes it might be really easy, right? We, especially if we can tell the person did not mean to hurt us and, and they're really sad too. And we can be like, oh, okay, it hurt me and it hurt them. Yeah, they didn't mean to hurt me, it was an accident. <laughs> and then other times, it might seem not so much an accident, what someone tried to do. Uh -huh. Right, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's what I just heard? Whoa. Oh, okay, it was not on purpose, that was an accident, I was there, we got, toys were going, toys were going, right? So how do you say yeah. you're sorry when you really mean it? How do you say it? Yo. yo, okay. Are you gonna accept that forgiveness when she says yo? So the, yo means something to you from that, right? Yeah. Are you gonna forgive her if she says yo? No. She needs a little more words. I'm with you. She needs a few more words, right? Can you just say like this? Oh, uh, okay. You. She, she. Love you. But how do you say you're sorry? And then what do we do for people? Do we show it? Right. We show it. Sometimes we might cry. Sometimes we give hugs. What do you say? Do you have something special that you say? Could mama tell me what it is? Oh, I'm sorry. And then how can I help? That's a good one. That's a really good one. And also like, I'm sorry. I will try not to do that again now that I know it hurts you. Right? Because sometimes we just might not know that something scared somebody or made them upset? Um, like, almost like, like when I got the boo-boo. Yeah, did you get a little boo-boo? Mm -hmm. And it was an accident from yeah. Chloe? Mm-hmm. Chloe did it on purpose. Oh, the cat did it on purpose? Yeah. Maybe. Like, like, <laughs> maybe. She said, nope, I'm not touching you. She said, no, I'm not touching you. <laughs> no, Chloe. Chloe is the kitty cat. So sometimes it's, is it really, really hard to ask for forgiveness? If you did something wrong, is that hard? Mm -hmm. like he Sh okay. He Sh yes, he almost, but he said he was a sorry. He also did a lot of things last week that made it. He apologized. He did good things. He made friends. He shared. Sh Hush. I love you, but you have a very apparently weird interpretation of what happened last week. Um, it was a fun day in the nursery. It was wild and crazy. But we all made friends and we all played in the kitchen too eventually. Took some time. So can we, can we ask, yes. 
Can we ask somebody for help when we need help asking for forgiveness? Can we? Are there people we can ask? Yeah? Are there grown-ups that we can ask for, for help? Yeah? Can we say a little prayer and say, God, I'm going to need a lot of help asking for forgiveness because I didn't do something real good? Or maybe it's our turn to, to forgive, and maybe we're just not quite ready. And it might take us a little while, right? Okay, can we pray? And I also have a cool little thing today so you can draw it. So this is, is there someone that you need to ask forgiveness from so that you did something maybe not so great? And then what does forgiveness look like? Okay, so you all get to draw. And there's some stuff on the inside too that you can draw or write or anything you want. And if we can't read, we'll help, right? Oh, she, Harper's already got her homework in her head ready to be written down there. That's, not, that's pretty normal. So can we pray together and ask for some help? Can we do that? Okay. Dear God, please help us because we know we're not always going to do the right thing. And we also know it's really, really hard for us sometimes to ask for forgiveness and to always try to do better after we are forgiven. And help us be accepting and have patience when we need to accept someone else's forgiveness from us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Now we get our baskets. Intro to the time of confession. Um, haven't heard many more appropriate than that. So I invite you to join in a time of release, a time of letting go of those things that keep us from being the best that we can be, and a time of asking God for help. Let us pray. We have strayed, O oh God, from your will and your way. Maybe like Joseph, we thought too highly of ourselves and lorded our privilege over others. Maybe like Joseph's brothers, we betrayed family and friends for our own self-interest or enslaved others to suit our purposes. Maybe we have lied to cover our tracks or forgotten our faith when it is convenient. We have failed you and each other so many times. Heal us, O oh God. Turn our hearts and actions back to you and lead us toward reconciliation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, here is the good news. Though our choices may be wicked, though our luck may have run out, though our pain may seem unbearable, God does not leave us stranded. God comes to us, joins with us, and leads us on a journey toward reconciliation and forgiveness. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated, and we are delighted to hear today from Jared Anderson on the euphonium, a version of Amazing Grace. It's a little different. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Thank you, Jared and Pat. That was a really cool arrangement of Amazing Grace. Liked it. Okay, before we start today's scripture, let's recap. Joseph was the second youngest of 12 brothers born to Jacob, who's also called Israel. In Genesis chapter 37, we read, Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made him an ornate robe. When his brothers saw that his father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. In that same chapter, we discussed two dreams that Joseph had had that also angered his brothers because it indicated that they were to bow down to him someday. So one morning, Joseph was traveling to see his brothers tending their sheep, but they had plotted against him. They threw him in a well and then later sold him into slavery. Then they applied animal blood to his robe, took it back to the father Jacob, and let them know that he had been killed by wild animals. In the meantime, Joseph was taken to Egypt and sold to a captain of the guard, Potiphar. The wife of Potiphar falsely accused Joseph of raping her, and he was thrown into prison. While in prison, Joseph had interpreted a couple of dreams of some of Pharaoh's servants. Later, Pharaoh had a disturbing dream, and no one could interpret it. Then one of the servants remembered Joseph. Joseph was summoned from prison and he interpreted Pharaoh's dream in such a powerful way that he became second in, in command to all of Egypt. Now Pharaoh's dream predicted that there would be seven years of famine. During the famine, Joseph's older brothers did travel to Egypt to buy some food. They did not recognize uh, Joseph as it was 20 some odd years later. And Joseph was treating them harshly pretending he did not recognize them and told them he thought that they were spies. So he held one brother in prison and sent the rest of the brothers back to return with the youngest brother, Benjamin, to prove that they were not spies. When they returned with Benjamin, after a series of twists and turns, they ended up bowing down to Joseph, which fulfilled one of Joseph's dreams. At this point in time, Joseph was ready to reveal himself. That now brings us to this morning's scripture. I will read from Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 15. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians, Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? but his brothers were not able to answer him. They were terrified in his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and not be, do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household and ruler of all of Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me, you, your children, grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father all about the honor accorded to me in Egypt and about everything you have seen and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him weeping. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Leanne. Fabulous job with that summary. That, that was really helpful for me. I hope it was helpful for you all as well. I had a dream last night 
that I gave a presentation for school about Anna and Elsa from Frozen, apparently. And then I failed for going over time. So I'm going to try to not make that dream come true <laughs> and do our best uh, to think about this idea of forgiveness in an appropriate amount of time. Let us pray. God, our hearts beat a little harder with the topic of sin and forgiveness, knowing that we fall all over the map in our need for these things. And so we ask your blessing on these words. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, my little dream about presentation about Anna and Elsa, I think you could describe as sort of an anxiety dream, one that doesn't have great import. But in the time of the Bible, and still today in many cultures and understandings, dreams can be interpreters of the future. They can give us clues about ways that we will be and interact with one another. And I can't help but think about a dreamer slightly more contemporary to our time of Langston Hughes when I hear of this story of dreamer. And I'd like to, to share with you his poem, Harlem. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? A dream deferred, particularly a dream of justice, a dream of making things right has deep power. And this story from our Bible talks about a way that that power can explode, both in terror, as happened when Joseph's brothers threw him in a well and, and sold him into slavery, or it can explode in grace, which is the story that we find as it comes to its conclusion many years later. I love the story of Joseph because everybody in it is imperfect. It's actually believable, right? Like people are messing up all over the place and no one gets away scot-free. And it actually gives us a shot, I think, of, of maybe imagining ourselves in the place where we could be embraced by God despite our failings, because frankly, you don't get much worse than what Joseph's brothers did. And so if God can embrace and forgive them, perhaps God can embrace and forgive us. It also tells us a little bit about the conditions, both that create injustice and rage and a feeling of explosion but also the conditions that can work toward forgiveness. The first thing this story does is set up the condition of injustice. One child of 12 is treated very differently. Now, if you've ever been a parent or a sibling, you know this is not okay. This cuts at the core of who you are and it can affect your whole life. And for Joseph, it had very poor consequences, even though his father, I'm certain, meant it for good. Injustice happens when, as one commentator I read wrote, love is unevenly applied. 
I thought was a really great definition. Unevenly applied love leads to injustice. And it plays upon this idea of scarcity, that there is not enough love to spread around. And that if one person gets love, then that means I can't get it. Now, the only people who can really fix this are the ones who are in power. In the case of this family, it would have been Jacob reapplying some love toward his other sons. But that injustice falls not on Jacob, but on his children, on the ones who are vulnerable. And the same thing can happen in people in power, in governments, and all sorts of things. It is the responsibility of those in power to evenly apply justice. As Cornel West famously said, justice is what love looks like in public. It is love evenly applied. So the brothers were really feeling this scarcity, this poor application of love from their father and among each other, and it just started building the fire of rage. They did not trust that there could be enough love. Now later, God will use this idea of scarcity to transform them into humbler people when they are no longer in as much power and they understand injustice better. But at the beginning, it just creates terrible situations. And this story in Genesis is written not just as a parable of family, but also as a parable of nations. As the history goes, each of the 12 sons of Jacob Israel formed a nation, and together they were the nations, the tribes of Israel. And so you can read into this story, not just family dynamics, but also political dynamics. It is in some ways a warning story for those who are in political leadership. Don't always trust that you'll be on top and do unto others as you would have done to you. Otherwise, dysfunction, aggression, injustice may arise. It's something that still plagues the nation of Israel and perhaps other nations closer to home. But the other thing this story teaches is that it is possible to break that cycle. Forgiveness is possible, not easy, painful, but possible. A few of the things we learn from Joseph's story is first that forgiveness does not always come immediately. We see a matter of many, many years of Joseph going through all sorts of ups and downs of life and learning about God's presence with him through all of it, when he is up and when he is down. And that growth allows him to be in a place where he might be able to offer forgiveness. But he doesn't still do it easily because there's this like subtle little part in there where the brothers come and he realizes who they are and he decides to play a little game with them. And where he is like, oh, how do I know you're not spies? And he sends them away and then they come back later for more food and he sends them away again and he hides a silver cup in his brother Benjamin's sack and then has them chase down for thievery. And so they come back just really shaking in their boots and the brothers beg that they will be taken instead of Benjamin because Benjamin is the other favorite son of Joseph and they do not want their father to hurt anymore. And it is only through that little game that he starts to believe that they are worthy of forgiveness, that they too have grown and changed. But you know, it's not the nicest way to make that sort of test. And so it's imperfect again. But it's also indicative of how forgiveness is an ongoing process, that it's a continual growth. We learn too that forgiveness ideally includes admission of guilt or humility on the one being forgiven. 
Now that is not actually required, but it does help. So if you're in the one of, uh, in the position of being humbled and needing forgiveness, it can be helpful to remember to show some humility. But what it really requires is trust in the abundance and the security of the forgiver. Because if Joseph were trying to forgive from the pit, it would not have been possible. If he were trying to forgive while still suffering so much, it would have been hard. It is much easier when he is in a place where he is safe and he knows that the brothers can no longer harm him, that he can choose to forgive because God allows that choice. And we also learn that it is a deeply emotional process. I don't know if there's another story in the Bible where someone cries as much as Joseph does, but he weeps so many times because it cuts to the core. The other thing I think we can learn from this is where is God in this process of forgiveness? Now, some many use this story to say look everything happens for a reason if something terrible has happened to you don't worry god's gonna use it for good i just want to say that is not helpful only joseph in this story is the one who gets to say what god and did did and did not do in his life those looking on the outside do not get to determine where God is working in someone's life. They could suggest, perhaps, but usually it's much more helpful to start with empathy and to start with saying, oh my gosh, this has been awful. And often this idea of where God has been working can only be seen in hindsight, and that doesn't mean it's not true. People in the midst of pain are in pain, even when they trust that God is working within them. And their faith in God may help them be more open to God's assistance in working through it. But again, that is something very personal between the person and God. Because I don't know about you, I don't want to believe in a God who would sell a child into slavery just to make a point. That's not a God I want to stand here and worship on Sunday morning. But I do believe in a God who finds us in the pit and in the jail cell and in our places of power and says, hey, what if you just looked at it this way? What if you looked for the gift? What if you looked for the hope? Could that change and make this a little more bearable? And if not, I'm still here. Joseph gets a choice in this story, a choice to choose to forgive. He could easily have tossed them into a dungeon and been done with it. And hardly anybody would have blamed that, him for that. But Joseph doesn't understand God as a puppeteer making things happen, but God as a power, a source of security that allows him to be okay in who he is so that he can offer grace and forgiveness. And so where God is in this is that source of security, that foundation that there is enough love, that God's love, at least, is evenly applied and that I can see another as God's face shining toward me, just as others can choose to see me as God's face as well. And so in this whole business of forgiveness, it is hard, but it can begin with rooting ourselves in the security of God, praying for ourselves, praying for one another, praying for the enemy, that they may have well-being, that they may have the food they need to survive. And then being patient 
and letting that forgiveness grow. And perhaps it can lead not to explosions of violence or dreams drying up, but an explosion of grace. There's so many ways we can give through our time, our talents, of course, financial gifts. It's easy to give financially. You can use the website and click donate. You can write a check and send it to the church office or simply place a, an offering in the plate in the North X. Let us pray. Dear God, giver of all good gifts, the scriptures are full of stories where you have been at work in the lives of your people, caring for us and providing for us, even when we don't deserve it. Through your grace, Joseph was able to provide for his family, even for those who sold him into slavery out of jealousy. Help us to trust you more in your providence, to be less anxious that we might not have enough. Offering our gifts with open hands and trusting hearts, in your name we pray, amen. invite you to remain standing in body and spirit as we close with our closing prayer. God, our source of love and strength, help us remember to turn toward you, to drink deeply from that well of love, to remember that it is applied with justice to us and to our friends and to our enemies. And help us be grounded in that strength that we can love one another. We especially ask, oh God, your strengthening love upon those in our hearts, including Cheryl, Jane, Violet and Adam, Becky, Ted, family and friends of Charlie, all who are sick, all who are homebound or in nursing and senior facilities, including Mary Lou, Mary Ellen, Doris, Gail, and people everywhere affected by violence, disasters, oppression, and war. And we lift in this moment of silence those who are close to our hearts and not yet ready for public speech. God, we dare to dream of a world that allows your love to be its guiding light. We pray all of this in the way that Jesus taught us, reaching out to you as our source of strength and love, our salvation and our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen before we close with our benediction i want to remind you that if you want a much funnier version of this story join us at 12:30. Uh, in the upstairs fellowship hall, Hoffman Hall, uh, and enjoy the film together. But whether you do or whether you don't, go forth from here knowing that you are wrapped in the arm of God's evenly applied love and that you are being held in no matter what. And may that be a source of strength for you now and always. Go in peace.